FM, the source. All right, five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Be careful who you put in charge of keeping the gate. You know, we have an irony that we are witnessing every day pretty much in the news. Um, and it happens on a local level as well as on a national and international level. The, the irony that I wanted to uh, point out, and I hope it, it dovetails well with the topic we're going to talk about. Um, the irony is that the keepers of the gate and those people we elect into office are keeping the gate, uh, the gate being the Constitution, and the Constitution gives us freedom of the press, right? Mm-hmm. And yet quite often, I mean, how many times have you seen like a video of a, of a journalist, you know, trying to interview a, uh, uh, an elected official, and the elected official will get angry or will send him a, a note later on or, or will not even allow him in as part of the, the news conference? Uh, yeah. I mean, our journalists are exercising the... One of the main reasons that we have a country, which is the freedom of the press, Mm -hmm. right? Without that, without that, then everything, all the news we get from our government comes from who? From the government itself, Mm -hmm. right? It absolutely astounds me that we have to uh, have a reminder all the time that we have freedom of the press and we we better defend that. Otherwise, we're going to lose everything. Tom Epperson has written in a book. It's called Roberto to the Dark Tower Came. It is a novel, but it does uh, talk about the very thing I'm talking about right here. In fact, one of the main characters is... Uh, gets a phone call and uh, basically is going to die if, if, he doesn't, <laughs> if he doesn't stop covering a story, right? And I think that's a true story, right? Yeah. Did I, did I hear that right? Okay. Yeah. Tom Epperson, it's an honor to have you on our show. Good morning, sir. Hey, Larry. How you doing? Robin told me you just woke up. How come? You, you don't get up early? Uh, well, it's, you know, it's just, the sun's, the sun's just coming up in, in Culver City, California. So, uh, but I'm, uh, I got my coffee and... Uh, oh. and Anyway, my animals never let me sleep very late. They want oh. me to wake up and feed them. And yeah, what kind of animals so, do you have? What kind of animals? Uh, uh, a dog and three cats. So that, <laughs> those are the kind of animals I've had too. I, when you said animals, I thought like ferrets or something. <laughs> Uh, well, I got I got some chickens in the backyard that I have to feed. So, but, uh, I'm from Arkansas originally, so you know how that is. So. Well, I find that amusing that it's that that your book is published through Meerkat Press. I, know. <laughs> I oh, think yeah. meerkats oh, are fun funny. animals. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 that's true. I'm I'm, I'm I'm an animal person. My wife's an animal person. So so before becoming a, a writer and a screenwriter, were you a journalist? And forgive me for not knowing that if you were. Uh, you know, yes. I mean, I, I did. I did different things. Uh, you know, I, I got. I got a, a, got a, got a little feedback. Okay. Is it? Did that help? Uh, oh, that's much better. Okay. I, Thank you. Sorry. I don't like. That. I don't want the sound of my voice anyway, and to hear it repeated back. To me. It was, <laughs> was unnerving. I apologize for that. Yeah, it was my fault. Uh, no, 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 that, that's okay. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in uh, in Arkansas, and I was an English major and got two degrees, and I wanted to be a great writer like Fitzgerald and Hemingway. And so, you know, I, I wrote uh, short stories and poetry and a couple of novels in my 20s, wasn't getting anywhere. I did do some journalism. My first job was a s- sports editor at the Jacksonville, Arkansas Daily News. I'm really into sports. I used to be more into sports than I am now. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. I did some I did some freelance journalism. I mean, nothing like the character in my novel did, but uh, <laughs> but, I, but but I like journalism. And then uh, by the time I hit thirty, I was just wow. I was just like nowhere. You know, I wasn't getting anything published and had no money and no future. And I grew up with uh, Billy Bob Thornton, and he was really in the same boat I was in, as if he was in the music world. And he was in a little group called Trace Ombres kind of a ZZ top kind of a group in Arkansas uh-huh. and play, playing around and wasn't getting, getting anywhere and I said Billy we both like movies why don't we just go out to California and break into the movie business so he said okay so we uh, we got in the car and uh, we got a road map and, and headed west oh wow and, uh, and had no had no money well we had $500 when we left that $400 when we got to LA and Ten days later, we had no money sitting on the Santa Monica <laughs> Oh, computer. my gosh. What, what, year, the Santa Monica? what year was that? It was 1981. 
1981. Okay. Gosh. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something funny. Oddly enough, we left on June 7th, 1981. This is the anniversary. I just realized that this is the anniversary yeah. of the day we left. It was how many years ago? 30, ooh, 37. Uh, so, uh, so, so you're on Santa Monica Pier with no money. Where did you spend the night? I mean, did you, were you homeless for a while? Uh, well, we were never completely homeless. Um, Billy had a cousin that lived in Rialto, California, which is out in the desert in an hour or so. Okay. She was married to a Mexican truck driver named Nick, and so he went to... <laughs> it's just the, the adjectives help. Hello. Yeah. I'll paint the picture. He, he, he walked up, he walked up to, to a McDonald's to a pay phone and, and called his guys and said, Hey, it's me, Billy Bob. Me and my friend Tom are in town. Can we pay you a visit? <laughs> oh, no. So, so we, we drove, she said, sure. So we, we drove out to Rialto, stayed there for three weeks, actually slept underneath the pool table in the rec room. And uh, Billy had been working for the highway department before we left. He actually had a $400 retirement check coming to him. So we were waiting for that. So when we got the, the $400, which is like a new $400, because we had $400 before when we right. Uh, <laughs> right. arrived. Right, so you're so starting we, we, over. Armed with our new four hundred dollars, we drove back into LA. We actually found an apartment. Well, it wasn't really an apartment; it was really kind of like a motel room for uh, ninety ninety dollars a week. Oh my gosh! And one room, and we had one bed, which we wouldn't sleep in together because you know real men don't sleep in the same <laughs> bed together. <laughs> right, so right, right. We would we would swap out. I mean, one would sleep on the floor one night and that kind of thing and Billy got a job at a Shakey's Pizza Parlor and we and you know long story short we, we kind of hung on by our fingernails for, for a few years and finally started to have a little bit of success and uh, and then um, here we are so <laughs> who better for worse who hit the home run first you or, or him I'm sorry who what who hit the home run I'm trying to be metaphorical I don't know how to oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who, who hit the home run? Yeah, who had the big break speaking? first? Huh? We we had the we had a big break together. Uh, we we had a you know we we sold a few scripts that didn't get made, and then we you know Billy had a few acting jobs. Remember, one of his jobs in the movie was Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town. That was a real classic, which I'm sure you remember. It was. <laughs> not, not <the> best. <laughs> it's actually not a bad movie, uh -huh. and. Uh, uh, and, and then we actually made a, got a low-budget movie made in 1991 starring the late Bill Paxton, a great oh. guy. He, 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 passed, he passed away last year. Just a wonderful guy. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, it's ter terribly, terribly sad. He's only 61 years old. And uh, he, he played a small-town uh, chief of police in, in Arkansas who runs a foul of some big city criminals from L.A. It's kind of a modern-day high noon. And um, it actually, well, when it came out, it went nowhere, and it was going to go straight to video. And then actually, Siskel and Ebert actually saw it at a film festival and started to, pr to promote it. And it became this sort of a big independent hit. Wow. And, and uh, Siskel, Ebert named it the second best movie of the year, and Siskel named it the best movie of the year. Nice. So they, we really, and, and it broke things open for us, and uh, writing-wise for Billy and me, and also acting-wise for Billy and we really owe Siskel and Ebert who they Sounds passed like away too we, yeah, we, we, yeah. Owe, we owe them I, I wouldn't say we owe them our careers I think we would have eventually broken through yeah, yeah. we've been out here ten, we'd have been out here 10 years without much success so. yeah they, they, mm -hmm. they catapulted you for sure <clears throat> yeah I mean you need a little luck in life you can be as talented and determined and all that good stuff as you want to be but you need you need luck in life. So I guess I I never realized that Billy Bob was also a, a writer. I didn't know that. Hmm. Oh yeah, Billy's a great writer. Well, Billy Billy won a, a writing Oscar for Sling Blade. He, he he wrote the script for that. Oh really? So, that I didn't know. Yeah. Oh yeah yeah. So Billy's a, a very talented writer. So we've written several movies that have gotten one false move, a family thing starring Robert Duvall and. 
Wow. Name's Earl Jones. Yeah. Uh, the, the Gift, the Gift, starring Kate Blanchett. Yeah. Billy's, mo- Billy's mother was a psychic, uh, a small town mm-hmm. psychic. Her, her, her husband died at, at the age of 42 of, of lung cancer, and she was left to raise three sons by herself, including Billy. And she made her living as a psychic. People would come to her house, and she would give readings. And so we wrote a movie based on her. Oh, wow. Kate Blanchett. Uh, Kate Blanchett paid, uh, played, you know, a version of Billy's mother. I think I so, saw that. Didn't I see The Gift? Was that one of yes. the songs? I yeah. think so. I love Kate yeah. Blanchett. So did she ever give oh, yeah, you a reading? Good. Did it, her, his mother ever give you a reading? Yes. And did she yeah, say, yeah, she, go go to L.A. and, and you'll, you'll be fine with $400? Uh, you know, she didn't say that directly. Specifically? Uh, I, I'll tell you one thing she did say to Billy and me when we were about to go to, to L.A. She said, you're going to beat somebody named Lester in L.A. It's going to be very important to your career. And we thought, Lester? I mean, Lester is like somebody you meet in, in Arkansas. <laughs> to L.A. and meet somebody named Lester is going to help us. <laughs> the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that seemed, that seemed to make no sense. And then when we got there, um, an actor named Jeff Lester, uh, whom we met because I knew his girlfriend, I knew his girlfriend's mother a little bit from Arkansas. So he 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 was very nice to us. He got us into a, uh, it got Billy into an acting class, and I would go to the acting class too just to monitor it. And this is right after we we got here. I mean, within weeks, and we were still living out in Rialto, and, and Billy was in this acting class. And, in that first three weeks and we make connections in that class that resonate to this day i mean wow so so so, so we she, did meet someone named lester that made who a big was difference. instrumental in our careers yeah oh isn't that amazing i, I find that yeah, stuff it, fascinating and so the, you based the story on her did, did, did you yeah. did did he believe in his mom in that regard or was it like oh no. yeah Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she, she, she was the she was she she, just, she passed away uh, last year. She was she was the real deal. I mean, I know there's a lot of fake psychics who right, right. kind of raise their eyebrows and all that kind of stuff. And I'm you know I'm I'm open minded about things, but I want evidence. And you know, she gave me readings. She predicted that would meet the the girl who became my wife. You know, I mean, uh, she. You know, it's not like everything she said came true. And, and one thing she said, she says, she, she didn't think the future was set, and it was. She thinks she, she would. She thinks there are probabilities in the future. You can go. If you go this road, this will happen. If you go that road, that will happen. And so I think she would come up with an array of possible futures for you. Yeah, I, I, and that does sound like the real thing too. I, I, I believe that in the course of years of doing this. Because of um, you know the opportunity to speak to really talented people, I, I believe we've had a few that we've had on the air that they hit it on the head for us too. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, yeah th- 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 there's definitely something to it. There's, I believe that there's a spiritual aspect to life, and I don't pretend to understand it. Uh, I just think human beings are, you know, uh, mm-hmm. tiny little creatures on a tiny little planet, and we don't understand the universe. I, I'm with I think you. We do. Oh, we don't. We think we understand it, and we really don't uh, yeah. understand it. That's really the truth. <laughs> That's really the truth. It, it just drives me nuts when I have people who are so sure that they're so sure about the meaning yeah. of life or everything, anything else. You know? Yeah. It's. I mean, it's. It's. It's a, it's a struggle to. I, I think. I think we're put here to struggle to find what the meaning of life is oh to gosh. find it out for our, for ourselves. I wonder. I think that. that's what. I think that's what it's all about, personally. Yeah. And I think we're meant to struggle, and we're meant to learn, and we're meant to strive. And that's it. That's awesome. And, and maybe someday, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an old hymn called Further Along. You know, further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Actually, I, I kind of teared up yeah. when I was quoting that. I got, I got chills, but I think someday we'll understand.
Do you know, I, I also wonder about, um, we, I, we haven't even started talking about your book. Oh, my gosh. But I'm loving the conversation. <laughs> but, and we will. But, but I wondered about reincarnation once. And I thought, well, more mm-hmm. than once. And if we do come back, I hope I don't have to relearn the same lessons. I mean, learning a language or learning math, that's not what I mean. I mean, like, I made some mistakes in my life, you know. And, and I don't right. want to make those same stupid, like, the things that would be in the classification of stupid like not enough wisdom or something i hope there's wisdom i hope we carry wisdom to the next life if there is one well so, so, so supposedly i'm, I'm, I'm open-minded about reincarnation I, I definitely believe it's possible and i think there's some evidence that that it's real and and to me it's it's a cool idea i mean i i would like there to be reincarnation and it makes sense that you would be on this search for meaning through many different lives uh, I know what you're saying about having to do the same stuff again, but I really don't want to do math again. I really don't, I don't want to. I really don't want to. I really don't want to learn to do long, long division. I remember being a little kid, and I would, I would, I would like rub holes in my paper with the eraser, trying to do long division. It was nightmarish, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. But uh, you know, I. I, I do think you learn, but maybe you regress, too. I mean, I think someone who lives a terrible life and commits crimes and hurts people, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. It's a, Maybe it's a bit of a set pack, a setback on their reincarnational journey. Yeah, it could be. Um, so tell me about the book. The, the book is fictional, and I, for some reason, thought that there was a basis on you know, a true story. Is there? Uh well, yes. Uh, it was about 10 years ago, I read an article in the LA Times. It's a first-person story by a young journalist in Somalia named Abukar. You know, Somalia is one of those chaotic, war-torn countries. And, and the story starts off, he, he gets an anonymous phone call one morning, and a voice says, Abukar, you need to leave the country or you will be killed. And as soon as I read that, I thought, wow, that's a great beginning for a novel. So that, Roberto to the Dark Tower, in my book, begins exactly the same way. Uh, Roberto, you have 10 days to leave the country or yeah. you, you will be killed. Yeah. So, 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 so to that extent, it's based on, it had a seed of truth in it. Uh, you know, the character of Roberto is, it's, it's a, to me, he's a sort of a universal figure. I mean, he's, he's the journalist in pursuit of the truth, and he, he's, he knows it's dangerous And he, sometimes. I mean, I mean, in America, I mean, I, I loved your, real, your little you know, prologue about how important freedom of the press is in America, and, and we, we take it for granted. And other countries, you know, there's a lot of things wrong with America, but freedom of the press, that's a good thing. It is a and good we, thing, we, we, yeah. We, we, have, we have a lot of personal freedoms here that we take for granted, and they just don't have them in other countries. And in other countries, journalists are often killed. They're kidnapped, tortured, killed, bad things happen to them. You know, America is not like that. You know, we, we have to fight. We have to fight for what we have. Don't, we have to not take it for granted because it, it, right. it can go away. It can right. go away. Right. Well, and again, going back to the opening, uh, we have so many stories of journalists that you see them sometimes on videos. They're be on the TV cameras on them, and the, the mic is still open or whatever, and you'll hear them say, "You better not. Pro- you better not publish that one." Right? And it's like what? Right? <laughs> right? Uh, there, been I congressmen. I mean, people elected to high office are doing things like that. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll get away with as much as they can. So you you gotta you gotta you gotta push back. Yeah. You gotta push back. And the way you broke it down, your uh, chapters in the book. I mean, it's it's like count. I mean, he's there, and they're like right. counting down to the day that he's going to die. But in the right. dialogue with himself and the other characters, they're talking about weddings and all of this stuff. Yeah, the, you know, the book is, it's, it's, it takes each, you know, each day is a chapter. He's got 10 days to leave the country or he'll die. And then he, he's, got, he's going to leave the country, but then he's going to join his fiance in uh, uh, the beautiful island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean, and everything's going to be happy. But then he hears about a big story in the jungle. He just has to go cover it. He's going to do a quick trip into the jungle, get the story, and then get out of the country before his 10 days are out. And then the journey into the jungle turns into this nightmarish heart of darkness 
kind of experience. Uh, and you don't know until the very end of the book, I mean, literally the last paragraph, whether, whether Roberto is successful. Oh, whether my he, gosh. Whether he lives or dies. So now, now I'm going to look at the last paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> but you also, your, your book also reminds us of, of the violence that happens. Yeah, I mean, th- th- this country, it, it's, a, it's a fictional country. It's really mainly based on Colombia. You know, I, I, made a, I have friends in Colombia. I've made trips to Colombia. You know, I've gone to the jungle in Colombia. I've gone to the Amazon to research the book, and I know quite a bit of, about it. And violence in Colombia and, and other Latin American countries has just been horrendous. And the kind of stuff that, you know, that in the Middle East, it's like, oh, I don't want to go to the Middle East. They cut people's heads off. Uh, well, they they cut people's heads off in places like Colombia too, and they mm-hmm. they do brutal things that I don't want to disturb your listeners with <laughs> this early in the morning. But it, it, it's the violence is is terrible, and the people who fight against it are are heroes in my book. I, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have the courage that Roberto would have because I don't want to die and be kidnapped or have my family killed and yeah right, and, right. It's, it's a special person that can be a journalist or in, you know in a country like like columbia they're, they're, they're my heroes oh my exactly. god exactly no this is a good book. i don't this is one of the best interviews ever i i just love the fact that you were you allowed us to kind of go everywhere else and then the book of just so much fun hearing your your story i i uh, i was in santa monica in 1977 and sleeping, uh-huh. so also sleeping on the floor. In this case, it was my brother's floor, and uh, uh-huh. and, I, and in fact, I worked on that pier. I worked at a taco place called the the Cocky Moon. <laughs> really? Yeah. Cool. And, and I uh, didn't. Uh-huh. I was the only one who did not speak Spanish. And then uh-huh. later on, I worked at the pizza place on the beach, a few maybe half a mile from the from the pier. So. Oh, so you know, you know that area? Yeah, sort of familiar with the area. Yeah, um, I can't. Uh-huh. I want to get back one day, but it's been a while. But you, you oh. don't. But but you don't just uh, you know focus on the violence and the shadiness. There's also the human emotion. There's also love in the book. It's not oh, all I'm, dark. It's wonderful. I'm glad you said that, Robin, because I don't want people get. I don't want people to get the wrong idea that this is just a, a sad, dark, brutal book, because I think there's a lot of humor and love and joy in the book also. Exactly. No, it's excellent. Uh, I have a copy of the book. If anybody would like it, call me, and I'll leave it here for you on the desk. Um, the rest of us will have to go buy it. I found it on Amazon, where you're getting really good reviews. Do you have a website you want to recommend, or just send people to the bookstore? Uh, well, they can go to my website at tom at tom and you know, learn about me and get the book and all that's good stuff. All right. Uh, Tom dot com. And again, on Amazon, the book, this book is called Roberto to the dark tower came. Or do you say Roberto? Do we say it the Spanish way? Roberto? I, I, I can't pronounce it the uh, Spanish way. I want to pronounce it the Arkansas way. So. <laughs> uh, we, we found a book trailer on Vimeo too. That oh, was really, really nice. Yeah. Oh yeah. Look, look at my book trailer. I, I went back to Columbia last fall. <clears throat> One of my best friends is a filmmaker in Columbia and we made a, a, a trailer for the book, went into the jungle and had a lot of fun. So oh my God. That's available on, it's all available YouTube, Vimeo, you know. I want to see it. Google it. It's pretty amazing. Okay. Uh, th- Tom, thank you for giving us such a great interview. That was very fun. And hopefully it wasn't too early for you. No, no, no. It was fun. And if you guys make it out here, give me a ringle. Give me a, a jingle and we'll uh, get together. All right. Can we sleep under your pool table? <laughs> Why well, you can't? I do have a pool table, and you can sleep under my pool table. Uh, thank you, Tom. That was fun. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll be right back. All right, bye bye. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville.